Well, last, let's start off from the court. Because the Attorney General and Minister for Justice, Godfrey Diabo Adame, has served notice he will appeal against the 2 1 Majority Court of Appeals decision that quashed the controversial trial of the minority leader, Dr. Casey Alatoforsen, and businessman Richard Jackpa for allegedly causing financial loans to the state. Case Alato Forson and Richard Jackba, who is a representative for Big C, were accused of causing a financial loss of 2.4 million euros to the state in a deal to purchase 200 ambulances for the country between 2014 and 2016. The court said the two have no case to answer and therefore stepped aside an earlier decision of the trial high court for the case to proceed, for which Richard Jackba, the third accused, has had to call a number of witnesses. Now, in a statement issued by the Attorney General shortly after the ruling, Godfrey Dame indicated that his office, quote, considers the decision of the Court of Appeals to be perverse in the quest for public accountability and the rule of law. The decision clearly is heavily against the weight of the cogent evidence led by the prosecution in substantiation of all the charges against the accused persons at the trial. Unquote. Now, this afternoon, we'll break it all down here uh, for you on the Pulse Plus, bring you some more reactions to this developing story. First, how did the judges vote on this particular case? Let's share with you how the judges voted in this particular case. Now, uh, Justice Alex Pokemon Champon, who presided, uh, dissented from the, the you, know, uh, uh, you know, he dissented from, from uh, the decision. Uh, Justice Kweku Tewia, Akabua for granted the permission of no case filed by uh, Dr. Kiselato Forsen, and then also Justice Philip Bright Mesa also granted that application of no case brought to, to the court by Dr. Kiselato Forsen. Now, uh, uh, we have reactions from the Attorney General and other parties in this case for you. But right now, let's bring in legal affairs correspondent Latif Ridusu, who has just returned from the court and joins me in studio with a lot more Latif. So, First, let's set, let's set the setting in court. How was it like in court this morning? Uh, so two courts, the mm. Court of Appeal mm -hmm. and then the High Court. Great. Uh, you know, this information about the ruling of the Court of Appeal came in at a very odd time mm. at the blind side of most of the I mean, judicial press corps members. And so you wouldn't get what exactly transpired within that particular court. Mm. We got to know about it after the ruling was made by mm. the Court of Appeal. Mm. Because you just touched on how the judges ruled, mm. just to brief our audience about what they said mm. in those rulings yeah. that, that came out. That's so so in, in taking the stance they took, what the they really said, they exactly. exactly. Yes. Mm. So, so interestingly, like mm. you pointed out, Justice Alex Pokwe Champo, who presided, mm. actually dissented. Mm. And then the other two members on the panel granted, granted the application. The application. Okay. Uh, so let's start with A1. A1 here refers to Dr. Dr. Kesela to forcing. And Justice Kweku Teria Akabuafo, mm. this is what he said when Dr. Ato Forsen brought up this no case application. Willfully causing loss to the state and intentionally misapplying public property. Mm. A3 also. His accusation was that he was charged with willfully causing financial loss. And this is what Justice Kweku Teria Akabuafo said. Mm. He said, accused not to be forced to assist in his prosecution. The prosecution failed to establish sufficient evidence. Trial judge Ed in calling on A1, mm -hmm. that is Dr. Casey Lato forcing mm. to open his defense and that no positively proven facts were made by the prosecution. There is no link between the evidence heard and what happened for the third accused person to be called to open defense. Mm. Third accused person here referring to the businessman Richard Jackpa. Jackpa. Mm. The appeal filed by both should succeed and the order of high court set aside. Mm. The appellate are and should be hereby be acquitted and discharged. Mm. That is the ruling by 
Justice Aka uh, Boafo. Mm. Then we come to Justice Bright Mensa. He said, apart from the letter A1 wrote, he did not do much to be asked to open his defense. Ministry of Health, who has to do pray inspection and not A1, Dr. K. Silato Forsen. Okay. So here, we are going back to Richard Enimana. If you recall, mm -hmm. he was among the three yes. standing trial. Mm -hmm. He was left off the hook yes. because of his ill health. He has to travel and, 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 and the state filed a, a, a null and on his, his yeah. behalf. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, the, the Court of Appeal is saying that <coughs> if for anything at all, it should be the Ministry of Health that mm. should be held accountable with regards to this particular ambulance procurement. Mm. Reasons not explained, the health ministry refused to do that and should be held accountable. Mm. As of today, the ambulances are still at the port and that cannot be blamed on A1, mm. Dr. K. Selato Forsen. No prima facie has been made for accused to open their defense. Although this is in stark contrast to the High Court's decision. Okay. That, and remember, the High Court judge is also a Court of Appeal judge. Okay. She's only sitting at the High Court with additional responsibility, mm. but she's a Court of Appeal judge. Now, mm. the Court of Appeal is saying in this ruling that no prime facie has been made for accused to open their defense. Mm. But the High Court ruled contrary that prime facie case had been made. Reason why the case went on and mm. on and on. But for that, the case would have been ended since 2021. Mm. On A3, so uh, the, he rounded, the, 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 he rounded the, the, up This by is still saying, Justice Bright Mensa. Bright Mensa. He mm. rounded up by saying the evidence by prosecution is not reliable for a court to deal with them. Okay. Then we move on to on A3, that is mm -hmm. by Mensa on A3. Mm he -hmm. says, no evidence for him to be called upon to answer. Money paid was because he take instructions against his principal. His principal here, Kudu, we are talking about Big C, mm -hmm. the Dubai-based business, okay. uh, which Richard Jaka was acting as an intermediary between them and then the Ministry of mm -hmm. Health. Mm -hmm. If there is any financial loss, that was based on the health ministry's recklessness and be blamed on ministry of health. If they worked in the interest of the state, the whole ambulance would have been dealt with. Mm. Hujo, this, is, mm. Mm. this is like the crux mm. of, of the ruling. Yeah. Now yeah. everything is being put on the ministry of, of health. What? That if they did their work mm. well, if they conducted the pre-inspection, and then found out that the ambulances were not fit for purpose, then we wouldn't have been here today. So meaning that the three accused persons were standing trial. If there should be anybody at all to be blamed, it would have been A2. A2. Not A1 or A3. A3. Okay, And A2 was let go. Go. And then these, and were, then okay. these two were rather were the ones that were standing trial. Very interesting. Well, yeah. So well, both appellants have made a case for them to be acquitted mm -hmm. and discharged. Okay. Their appeals are seed and accused are hereby acquitted and, and discharged. Okay. Now, this is the dissenting view by Justice Alice Pukwe Champo. He mm -hmm. says, the trial judge did not err by holding accused to answer. Okay, all right then. So, so it means that this case is off the table. For now, momentarily. For now. Yes. Because the AG you know says the AG he will file an appeal, but for now, it is off the it, table. It is off. But you were in the high court waiting for the case itself to, 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 to progress today. Yeah. How was it like? Because I'm sure the judge would have prepared to come in and, and, and attend to the case. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the lawyers were actually in court. Lawyers for A3, mm -hmm. some of them were in court, but the lead, lead lawyer wasn't there. Title okay. Soy was not there. Mm -hmm. Lawyers for Ato Forsen, none we're of them showed there. up. Their prosecution, none of them showed up. Okay. But some of the journalists, we were in court, mm. and they, you know you have audience coming in to also monitor. Some of them were also seated. Then we saw one of the clerks call the lawyer for A3, uh, Ashia, who was in court, and then she whispered something to him. Now when he came back, we heard him telling Richard Jaqua, who was in court, 
Dr. Casey Latum Fossin was not in court, mm. but Rachel Jackpot was in court telling Rachel Jackpot that the judge said she wasn't going to sit on the case. Okay. Then they all stood up and then left. Oh, so that's how, that's what they told them. Yes. They didn't tell them that the appeals court says ABC or... We didn't hear that conversation. Okay. All right. We only heard that the judge said she is not sitting on okay. the case mm. today. Mm. And so they stood up and left and we all followed suit and then we caught up with, with them outside and then we got a few words from the A3, uh, Richard Jappa, who, who has been very, mm. um, you know, full of life, if, if you like, after this decision by the Court of Appeal. And interestingly, he rushed to the High Court and mm. you know what? He was going there to pick his passport. Okay. Yes, he was going to pick his passport. Richard Jackpa. Yes. Okay. Because, you know, as part of the bill condition, mm. he was made to submit his, his passport. passport. So he was going for it. He was going for it. Okay. And I asked him if he was going to leave, leave the country. Mm. Yeah, one of the questions I asked him in the interview, mm. I'm sure he's going to introduce that. Okay. Interview. But you've been, you've been speaking to Richard Jackpa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so I, I will bring you that interaction uh, that my colleague, Latif Idrisu, has been having with Richard Jackpa just after... Uh, you know, that, that uh, development in court. Okay, so we'll, we'll bring that uh, to our viewers shortly. Uh, but just after you, you had spoken to him, we got the Attorney General himself speaking uh, to MFA Apao uh, on the media news on Joy FM about this particular development. He poured out what he, he views, his views are about this uh, judgment that the uh, Court of Appeals had pronounced on this particular case. Let's, let's listen to him. I'm not the only one who was, who was surprised by this ruling. I'm sure the entire nation is surprised because indeed the public has been following the trial and the evidence led by the prosecution. <clears throat> it is not in doubt at all whatsoever that there has been financial loss in this matter established. It's a case where Vehicles supporting to be ambulances were important to the country in December 2014. Indeed, they were bereft of any equipment or parts that would render them um, to be used as ambulances. Apart from that, there were serious uh, material defects with every part of the vehicle. Indeed, the specification of the vehicle itself was wrong. The kind of vehicles that were supposed to supply in the contract were not what was supplied. That is not in doubt. And it is a matter all on record. There's also um, a report that was obtained by the Minister of Health in 2015 when the NDC was in power, which stated categorically that the vehicles could never be converted into ambulances. So clearly, the vehicles are of no use to the nation, so financial laws has been established. Now, the only issue then left is the link between the accused persons and the offense. And it's again a matter of record that the former Minister for Health, who was in office at the time that the transaction was brought into being by the act of Dr. Atufosin, had actually written to the company who supplied the ambulances, not to supply the ambulances, not to supply the vehicles at all. So Madame Seriety had written a letter cautioning against the, the transaction. And by that time, the transaction mm -hmm. had even lapsed. Mm -hmm. The vehicles were supposed to be supplied within 11 months. By that time, the 11 months had long elapsed. The vehicles were supposed to be supplied by December or November 2013. Well, so the contract was signed in December 2012. Yeah. Now, in August 2014, mm -hmm. Dr. Atiforsen, without any request whatsoever from Minister of Health, then wrote for the Bank of Ghana to establish this of credit. But, but, and it was after that that the vehicles were imported. For, for the so sake the of time, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, so if evidence has been laid, all the court is supposed to look at at that stage is whether the necessary ingredients of the offense um, had been established. And indeed, the next thing of the offense had been established. The trial court had held to way back over a year ago. The trial has since proceeded, and we have gone ahead to lead even further evidence to show the connection between the accused persons and, and, and the offense. But all and these the facts, Mr. Attorney General, all these facts yes. were before the Court of Appeal, yet they yes. took a decision that there's no case against these yes. two persons. And you still insist that it was a wrong decision by the Court of Appeal. What would you do about it? Precisely. I mean, so I'm a, a, a firm a believer in the rule of law. I'm an adherent to, to the rule of law. And clearly, I will appeal against the decision. This is the first time that a decision adverse to the prosecution has been um, given by a court. Remember when there was an order after we had led so much evidence against um, Dr. Opening 
the High Court actually ordered that we should commence de novo. What did I do? I filed an appeal to the Court of Appeal, and I was able to sustain the appeal. And, and so I, I think that that is what we've done promptly in this matter. We'll file an appeal to the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court to give a definitive um, 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 view on, on the matter. And I think that clearly in this decision by the, by the Court of Appeal is wrong, is unfair to the nation, and must not be allowed to stand. If indeed it stands, it, it will set a very dangerous precedent for the nation. It goes against the grain of all the authorities on causing financial laws in the country. And in my respectful view, there is no case in which financial laws has been more clearly established than this one. The financial laws established, and also as a result of the act of the accused person here, it's so clear. You find an accused person who <coughs> even profited several thousand euros out of the 2.3 million euros that was, that was paid for the ambulances. I mean, I think that this is so uh, offensive to the rule of law. And indeed, the decision must not be allowed to start. Well, it's surprising that you mentioned from the beginning that um, this decision actually came as a surprise to you and to Ghanaians, you say. You're saying that you were not aware at all about this decision that was going to be taken today, no, at least by the Court no, of Appeal. No, no, that's not the point I'm making. I'm saying that the federal decision, clearly, I mean, it's shocking. It's shocking because it goes against the grain of all the authorities on financial laws. It goes against the law, as we know it in the country, and clearly is a case where financial laws has been established. It's not in doubt. It's a case where the acts of the accused persons were the ones which directly caused the financial laws. Without it, there's no record at all in this matter of the Minister of Health requesting for the letter of credit to be established by the Minister of Finance. Indeed, the Deputy Minister of Finance then, Dr. Atiforsen, on his own, wrote for the letters of credit to be service. And then the LCs were not established for nothing. They were the means by which the vehicles were paid for. The letters of credit were the means by which the vehicles were paid for. And so if, if they were established contrary to the agreement, if they are established in favor of a company whose agreement did not even have parliamentary approval, the, 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 every aspect of this matter is bad. The company itself, the agreement itself, it's an financial business agreement. It never went to parliament. <laughs> so to start with, and then the vehicles that were supplied, Contrary to the specification under the contract, they are not the ones specified under the contract. The vehicles were bereft of any equipment at all. From 2014, when the vehicles arrived in the country, up to 2017, when the NDC left office, they could not even convert the vehicles into ambulances. And why, why was that so? Because of the report by the authorized delays mercedes Benz that the vehicles could never be converted into ambulances. And so I think that as the attorney general, it is nothing personal. It is a case where I seek to uphold the rule of law. And indeed, we have to test the soundness of this decision. And I have no doubt at all that the decision was most unsound and bad. So safe to say that at least you are heading to the Supreme Court as we speak. Yes, definitely. Well, Thank the, you very much. well looking at uh, the case in itself, just before you go, though, technically, it means that this whole ambulance procurement trial is over. As I said, there's mm -hmm. always an opportunity of an appeal. And we're going to um, um, explore that. But until so, then, for, until yeah, then, we for, can for safely now, yes, say. For now, it means that the, tr the trial is yes, suspended for now. But if the, co the Supreme Court makes a determination that indeed the decision of the court for appeal was wrong, it will lead to a continuation of the trial from okay. where we left off. But looking at the trial itself and some of the issues that came up, Mr. Dami, at least the issue about the plea bargaining, the amounts that Big C wanted to pay in all this, looking back in hindsight, you think we should have taken that money? At least we're, we were trying them for causing financial loss to the state. We had the opportunity to take some money, but yet we did not. Looking back on no, that. It is, it is not as simple as that. It, 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 again, everything must be done within the confines of the law. If a party, which is not a party to the proceedings, offers to pay money and for the accused person to, to let off. What will be the, 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 the position in, in which I find myself? That yes, I've agreed to the matter to be continued because uh, somebody sitting somewhere has offered to pay somebody. I mean, I think that even the public would have raised further questions against me, against my integrity and all that. And my integrity is what matters in the process. Okay. Indeed, it's a matter of record that the accused persons were interested in it. So why, why would it, the accused persons themselves openly and freely come forward and, 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 and make the plea bargaining proposal and rather hide behind third parties? But, 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 but to the lay person, but, but to the lay person, the ordinary person would say, we could have still taken the money and still go on with the trial, but we chose no, not but, to. Yes. No, so, so, so the trial can proceed. No, see, so the, the basis of, of the proposal by the accused persons was that I should listen to some third parties and truncate the trial. So indeed, the, the, the two could never have been compatible within the circumstances in which we find ourselves.
Well, but what would you say finally to persons who would say that Godfrey Dami as the attorney general is emotionally attached to this particular case? And, and how is that so? How would I be emotionally attached to the matter? Never at all. Otherwise, there cannot be any prosecution for financial laws in the country. I think that all cases are prosecuted at the instance of the attorney general. The attorney general is responsible for every prosecution in the country. And, and so there cannot be a question of um, the attorney general being emotionally involved or connected um, to any matter at all. It's a case where I think that the uh, public accountability must reign and the quest of public accountability in the country must really must really prevail. I think the situation where some people, with all respect, find or consider themselves to be above the law, above the rule of law, must not, must not happen. The rule of law implies that everyone is underneath the law. We are all below the law, and we are all supposed to observe the law. No, no particular person or group of persons can be above the law. A trial is a trial. The ingredients of an, of an offense for stealing is the same, whether committed by um, a person highly paid society or by the lowest ranked member in society. It's the same. I mean, financial laws, financial laws. Mm. And indeed, the essence of these financial laws cases is to check public accountability in, in, in office, is to ensure that public accountability is, 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 is upheld. So there, there must be a full opportunity for the state to, 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 to conduct its case. When it comes to financial loss cases, because it it, it goes it it it, it, it has far-reaching implications for the public place. Apart from the public place, has far-reaching implications for the way we conduct ourselves in, in public life. It has an effect on checking impunity in public life. Now, I think if you look at facts of this case, where a deputy minister can, with all respect, um, authorize a transaction. There's no basis at all. There's no request for the beneficiary um, ministry whatsoever, and, and indeed the purpose of the transaction turns out um, to be of no effect because the vehicles that were supplied were not one specified in the contract, were not a fit for purpose, were as were described in the words of Dr. Sebifia, mm. who was a minister for her. Ordinary vans which could never be used. And over two years while the MDC was in office, they could never convert it into, into ambulances. And there's also a technical report on it showing that they could never be converted into, into ambulances. I think that if the nation indeed um, um, would desire for its money to be, with all respect, um, thrown away in this manner, so be it. But I think there was accountability in public life. Well, so that was the Attorney General speaking to us uh, just after this particular uh, you know, uh, judgment was given by the post court. But we've also been speaking to Richard Jackpa, who is the third accused in this case, and here's how he reacts to the decision. This ruling is a victory for all democracy-loving Ghanaians and those who hold fidelity to the rule of law, no, to the law. So it's a victory for all Ghanaians. It's not a victory for me alone. And for all those who were praying and they saw that uh, we needed integrity in this country and they wanted that protected. And so it's a victory for everyone. When I spoke with you uh, during one of your interviews here at the court complex, you mentioned that the judge was treating you like a convict who is only going through the motion, and then at the end of the day, you're going to be thrown into jail. Do you regret that statement now that the case has been, I mean, taken off by the court of appeal? Not at all. I stand by it, because it's a fact. It was very obvious and clear. And my, the justice that I just uh, I got with all, all Ghanaians supporting it, I got it from the Court of Appeal and not from the High Court. The High Court, if you realize, we, we sat yesterday and we were to sit today, Tuesday, and we were to sit Wednesday. So you could see that she's in a hurry to finish this case before the election. Mm. So I didn't get my justice through the High Court or through Sewa, Justice Efia Sewa Sarabochi. No, it's from the Appeal Court, no. where there are men of integrity who look at the evidence as it is. And then they granted me my freedom. Would you, so I got justice from the Court of Appeal. Mm. So you were in a hurry to pick your passport here at the High Court. Are you planning to leave the country following all the, I mean, the hearing and all that has gone on? Is that the intention that you have right now? Oh, not at all, not at all, not at all. I'm, no, I'm going nowhere. If I'm traveling, it's purely to go and get my international business partners and try to see how I can get things back on track. How has that affected your business in any way? Oh, down to the ground. 
no, down to the ground, completely down to the ground. No, so I have a lot of work to do now. You know the AG has the or the prosecution, they could also go to the Supreme Court and also go for review if it goes against them. Is this something you are looking forward to? Are you prepared for that? More than prepared. Mm. Yeah. I'm always ready. Yeah. If the Attorney General wants to go to the court or uh, go to the Supreme Court to appeal against the ruling, I'll meet him there. Mm. Even if he doesn't win there, he wants to go for review, I'll meet him there. Wherever he wants to go, I'll meet him there. Mm. Yeah. So I don't have an issue at all. I'm really ready for this government. I'm ready for them. Mm. So all that I can say is that uh, my enemies and detractors have been put to shame. I've been vindicated and all those allegations that they level against me trying to dent my integrity because of the conduct of the crooked Attorney General Godfrey Dami, it hasn't worked. Uh, I've been vindicated by the ruling of the appeal court. I've always said that I'm an innocent man and I'm being persecuted for political reasons. And, and the Court of Appeal has vindicated me on that uh, stand that I've always been saying. What would you say did the magic for you in, in all this trial? What, what moment would you say stood out for you that did the magic for you? And oh, Dr. Well, Kishulat? It's all about my integrity. It's the integrity that uh, uh, gave me the justice. You know, and uh, you see, I couldn't turn my back or betray Atu or uh, the NDC party because I knew what this government was after. And I couldn't turn my back on my, on my party and then I couldn't also betray Atu Fawson. I couldn't do that because he's an innocent man. And it didn't resonate with my conscience and my, the way I do my things. And that is why I did what I did and I stand by it. If you live here, what would you say to your lawyer and what would you say to, say to your wife? <laughs> well, uh, I'll, since we've asked this question, I want to this point to thank all the lawyers that uh, in diverse ways contributed to this victory. In fact, starting with uh, lawyer uh, Rindo Sam, and then uh, lawyer Ampakosa, and then lawyer uh, Thomas Obin, who was just around here, and then also my current lawyer, lawyer Tad Yosori, and then lawyer Bafo uh, Esha. Uh, and all the team that contributed in diverse ways, those that were working behind the scene, getting in, uh, uh, cases for my lawyers, reading cases, and then working behind the scene. You may not see their faces, but they were really doing their work behind the scene to put together everything that my lawyers presented. I'm thanking all of them. Uh, it was a teamwork. You know, so all the past lawyers, they also contributed their ways throughout the process. So that's why I'm thanking all of them. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, how this trial? Change your perception about the country and how it's it's governed. Can oh it yes, oh yes, of course. How is that? Well, uh, what I see is that uh, we have a problem at our Attorney General, Minister of uh, Justice, and Attorney General's uh, uh, office. And what I will uh, entreat subsequent presidents is to really check the character of who they appoint as attorney general of the country because if you want to protect our democracy and the rule of law you must be very circumspect in who you appoint as your attorney general because he's number one enforcer of the law and all ethics of the legal system he's the leader of that so if you appoint a crooked person a rook who doesn't play by the rules, a gangster, and he comes and takes that position, then you can be very assured that innocent people, men of integrity, will all be sent to jail. No. You either join them to pillage and run the country down, capture the whole country, or they send you to jail. And most Ghanaians, a lot of people who are in this, uh, other institutions, they have no choice than to join them. So you can see that almost all the, uh, our institutions have been captured. They have been cowed into silence. We only have a few men of integrity who are still in the in state institutions, who are still trying to hold the rule of law and to protect this nascent democracy of ours. But if it were left to these people in government, there would be nothing left for Ghanaians. So it's very, very important 
that's when we, it is time for us to go and vote on December 7th. Ghanaians who want to protect this democracy and want to give the third independence to Ghana. And I always say we need to fight for a third independence because the first independence was secured by Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, the second independence was secured by the late far left and Jerry John Rawlings. And we are now going for our third independence. And that must be done by John Dramani Mahama. And we need Ghanaians to support him in that. Because we need to get in, give this country an independence. The country has been run down. We have very few men of integrity still in the judiciary. So we need to rescue this country. This country, we need an independence for this country. The third independence. We communicated this to Big C already. Oh, I've done that. In fact, I'm very happy in your jubilating. Yeah. So your business is coming up to stream now? Oh, well, to come, I would, I would now need to travel out and go and put up. Because what they did, it caused me a lot of international damage. So a lot of my international partners were a little bit uh, like a you know, They were pulling, they were pulling out on so many things. So I need to now fly out, go and reassure them, get things back on track. I just need to put my life back in order. No, and I need time to do that. So that's fair accused in the ambulance trial, Richard Jagba, who is a businessman. He says he's going to restart his business connections to get his foreign partners back, you know. But Latif, you've done some incredible job there. Uh, this is over. And until the AG gets back, we don't know. You know so, so we've lost the 2.4 million that Big C said he wanted to pay. Yeah, technically the 2.37 million euros. That's mm. you know there was a plea bargaining talk along the line. Yeah. But the attorney general decided that no, they wanted to actually go to the Get court to the, and yeah. prosecute them for causing financial loss. Mm. So the AG declined that offer of mm. paying back the 2.37 million euros. Mm. I'm not a lawyer. So I'm unable to tell whether or not with mm. this particular mm. court of appeal ruling, mm. the state has now actually lost the 2.37 million euros. Or oh, there's still or an opportunity. There's a window mm. of opportunity for the state okay. to recoup that amount. Back. Let's see what happens. But I'm grateful to you and kudos for that wonderful job that you've done Thank you. on this case. Well, so that uh, Latif Idrisi there, who is our court correspondent. But... You know that the uh, uh, A1 who is Dr. Kesalato Forsen is a member of parliament in the central region. Now, his constituents have been reacting to the development that came in this morning. Let's take you to the central region for that reaction from his constituency. Actually, I knew he, he was going to be vindicated because he's innocent and he did the right thing. He never did anything wrong. For them to accuse him of it, I know they were just going back and forth. And I know the government just wanted to use him as a scapegoat, which was not going to work. We knew we were going to win this case hands down. We knew we were going to win it from the onset. He's innocent, and it has been proven today. A sitting government is afraid of him. He's a very strong person, and they know the impact he has on the NDC and the followers he has. So they wanted to sabotage him by bring, bringing court issues to him, which was not going to work, and we knew he was going to win. This so, case. So I, you know, Atofos is our mentor, is our everything. He has done a lot for the youth of this town and in this constituency. He has secured jobs, development, everything, everybody knows. So when this issue came to court, we were very disturbed, especially those of us who follow Atofos. And I think this is a victory for the constituency, a victory for democracy, but everybody knows that. At of course, it doesn't supervise the work of Ministry of Health. Ministry of Health is autonomous. He's just doing, he's just a minister at the Ministry of Finance. And he just did something that we call, uh, it is mandatory. It is what the constitution obliged him to do. So we are very grateful to the public land. We are very grateful to the courts. We are very grateful to those people who supported At of course, through that his trial. And we are very happy that our member of parliament, which is our father, our everything, is now acquitted and discharged. And I know when we, the law says acquitted and discharged, no court can call this case again. There was no case at all. Uh, we, are, we are expecting a, 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 a more formal way of legal actions to be taken, especially when uh, somebody is a master of the law and then they tend to go or breach the law. Um, I'm saying Dr. Casalato Forsen, from the beginning, we know he was innocent. But the processes and some of the actions of the legal practitioners, 
I think it is a time the, 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 the highest court of law, being the Supreme Court, uh, takes such actions, especially when the master of the law goes against the law. Uh, and I must say emphatically that uh, Arthur Fawcett has been innocent from the beginning. Whatever plot it was to take him anywhere wouldn't succeed. We knew from the beginning. So it's not a shock news. Even though we are jubilating within, it's, it's a good day for the victory of the NDC coming up. But uh, we, are, we also urge that further proceedings or further investigations should be done so that any master of the law who went against the law uh, could be called to action and punished for the illegal act against the, the law of the Constitution. Yeah. So those were uh, reactions from Atu Forsen's constituency now. But what about Parliament? Let's take you to Parliament now. Uh, former Minority Leader Haruna Idrisu is warning Attorney General Godfrey Yabo Adame will face more legal defeat and embarrassment if he presses through with his plans to appeal the acquittal of Minority Leader Dr. Kesel Atu Forsen. The Court of Appeal by a 2-1 majority decision ended the trial of the Minority Leader for allegedly causing financial loss to the state. The AG has already signaled he will appeal the decision, but the NDC MPs who took to the floor of the House drabbed in white believe that he will be an exercise, or that will be an exercise in futility. We'll hear from the minority leader shortly first. Listen to the NDC MPs singing when their leader, Dr. Kinsalato Forsen, entered the chamber following his acquittal. <laughs> So those were MPs there singing for Dr. Kesela to force him when he entered the House after his acquittal uh, this morning. And Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent Kweku Asante joins us with more on this. Kweku, at what point did Harun Adrisu make this, his commentary on the floor regarding the attempt by the AG to file an appeal against the ruling today? Some people were taken by surprise by the chants and the songs that the NDC minority people were singing upon the entry of the minority leader. The majority leader, Alex and Afinia Margin, had just entered the chamber. He got up and he said he was surprised. What exactly was going on and why was, were the NDC MPs chanting and singing all those songs? It was then that Harun Ibrisu, the former minority leader, offered apologies mm -hmm. to provide that information, explaining mm -hmm. that they are here singing these songs because the, 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 the victory of Dr. Kisela Tupos had been secured today. But it was during that address that Harun Ibrisu did put in the message, warning the Attorney General that if he pressed ahead with this request to appeal, he will be embarrassed further at the Supreme Court. Listen. <laughs> with a submission of his case had no legal basis and therefore did not only discharge him but acquitted him. Yeah. So that is what we are celebrating and he's invited to celebrate us. Now Mr. Speaker, I hear, I hear the Attorney General 
Even his throat swallowing his humble pride. He's saying that he wants to uh, litigate on this matter. Mr. Speaker, we assure him that he will be further disgraced because this matter, this matter, if you want to try people, try them on matters which are legally meritorious. Letters of credit, letters of credit, and mere guarantees. I can go into the matter. This is parliamentary chamber. So, Mr. Speaker, the minority here is celebrating the independent, courageous decision of the Court of Appeal in acquitting the minority leader. That should be celebrated, that in the realm of separation of powers, at least one of the arms of government have stood up to a calling today that they are independent and courageous and will not be used as forum for the persecution of his political opponents. Now, so that's Harun Adjusudan. The majority leader himself has been responding to this in a very interesting way. According to the majority leader, Alexander Nafendo Markin, he celebrates with Dr. Kesela Sofosin in this. In fact, he goes ahead to say that he will be taking him to dinner of the sort and giving him a wine mm. to, to celebrate this victory. But he wants the NDC colleagues to stop politicizing the judiciary, celebrating when judgment goes in their favor and not celebrating or bastardizing the court when it doesn't go into their favor. Very consistent as a political class in our celebration of the judiciary. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the position taken by the Honorable Harun Ejusu. No executive arm of government can manipulate the judiciary arm of the realm. Mr. Speaker, it must never be said, never be said, that the judiciary is under the control of the executive. Mr. Speaker, we, we, Honorable Harun Edrisu, is a courtroom practitioner, just as I am. You were a courtroom practitioner. One of the things that we were taught at the bar was to accept the decisions of the court. You are leading the front bench of this chamber. Let us understand that there are situations where we disagree. And even when we disagree, the language, the approach is essential. I celebrate in your victory. And you know how much it means to democracy in this country. Minority leader on trial, you've gone through the system your belief in the judicial system. Today, on all fours, I don't take alcohol, but I can offer you a non-alcoholic wine. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I know Atu doesn't take alcohol either. No, no, I don't. I have serious allergies. Oh, we are not talking about other things. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I know Atu doesn't take alcohol either. Anytime you go for lunch, it is fruit juice. Mr. Speaker, if you disagree, with the system, use the system to correct it. So, Dr. Fawcett, congratulations. Congratulations. It's a hard-won victory. It is good for democracy. But I want, you to, I want to encourage you and your colleagues that it shouldn't be that today you've won, so the judiciary is independent. Well, Kwekwasante, there's also something interesting coming out of Parliament because we understand that the affirmative bill has now been passed. The affirmative action bill, which has been in and out of parliament for decades now, has finally been passed. In fact, parliament has been overworking itself, mm. working deep into the night over the last few days to work on this. And finally, the third reading has been done today. The Speaker of Parliament banging the gavel just a few minutes ago to signal the passage of this very important piece of legislation that is to ensure that there is equity in terms of the genders in the country. Mm. There's so much that has been said about this affirmative action bill that has gone through parliament, it's gone to the executive cabinet in and out. But finally, parliament has decided that this is going to be passed. And this parliament, this is parliament, is at the twilight of its life. It just has about six months or five months, I should say. Mm. They're actually indeed going on break today, set to return either in September or October. Mm. And they will only sit for a few days before breaking for full-scale election campaigning. Mm. So this is historic. The Speaker of Parliament himself 
having insisted that Parliament ought to pass this affirmative action bill into law before it goes on break. It will now head to the desk of the President for his assent, and this is something the Speaker of Parliament himself is celebrating, saying that this clearly shows that there's still a lot more work to be done, but this is not a bill about women, this is not a bill about any particular gender, it's just a victory for equity and equality. Mm -hmm. Well, in 2020, the, the Speaker himself noted that the bill will not be passed under the Certificate of Agency. I, 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 I suppose the amendment that he wanted in the bill to be, to be done have all been done. Well, yes, if it did go through a Certificate of Agency, the Speaker of Parliament was concerned mm. that this would have meant that not a, a good job might have been done, given how important and how crucial this bill is to the work of Parliament. It is for this reason... But the Speaker of Parliament is saying that it has to go through all the stages of lawmaking in the House. Perhaps to this, Harry Mabrish, who had made some points about what he believed to be certain unconstitutional provisions in there, mm -hmm. a bit of that has been taken care of. Certain amendments have all been done, and this bill has not been passed. Of course, there are still provisions in there that some may say may be unconstitutional or maybe unlawful. It is not up to them to go to the Supreme Court to test it. But first and foremost, this bill will now head to the desk of the President for assent, and then officially, mm. no below. All right, Kweku, grateful to you. That's our Parliamentary Affairs correspondent. Kweku Asante there. This is still the pause here on the Join News Channel. We'll take a quick break. But stay with us because we'll be back with more. Hi there. You can follow your superstation Love 99.5 FM on all social media platforms. We're on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and not forgetting YouTube. Feel free to connect with us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, Love 99.5 FM. You can also click on the notification bell so that you're notified always of our content. Feel free to also log on to myjoyonline.com where we have content specifically designed just for you as well as our podcast. So stick and stay with us at Love 99.5 FM where we bring you nothing but love and joy. Welcome back from the break. Now, the ongoing industrial action by the Colleges of Education Teachers has created uncertainty for teacher trainees regarding their academic future. The strike, which has been prolonged for almost two months, has disrupted the regular academic schedule, leading to doubt about whether the trainees will be able to sit for their semester exams as planned. Leadership of the Teacher Trainees Association of Ghana has reiterated that lack of uh, clear communication and resolution from government in addressing the demands of their trainees, uh, of their teachers, has left many of them in a state of limbo. Unsure about how to proceed with their studies and prepare for the exams, Swale Razak is president of the association and he has been addressing a news conference. This prolonged disruption has precipitated a critical crisis, jeopardizing the future of thousands of future educators. The strike has left teacher trainees in a state of uncertainty with their academic progress halted and their future prospects hanging in the balance. The government has failed to provide clear communication regarding the resumption of academic activities and a clear path forward. We do not know whether they will be required to sit, whether we will be required to sit for examinations for the semester marked by no class attendance or if they would need to prepare for exams amidst the strike. Also, level 400 students do not, do not know as to whether on 7th September they will be completing from the Colleges of Education. The strike has imposed immense pressure and financial strain on all teacher trainees, especially the level 400 teacher trainees. Many have been compelled to extend their rental agreements incurring additional costs. All right, so that was Swale Razak addressing the news conference there. But Swale himself, who is the president of the Teacher Trainees Association of Ghana, TTAG, uh, is, is joining me in studio now with more. Swale, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming through. Good afternoon. But, but last week when I was speaking to uh, a member of the vice chancellors, or the, do you call it vice chancellors? I mean, the principals, Prinkoff. Prinkoff. Yeah, he, he said that, I mean, things were okay and that they were going to just increase the contact hours so 
that you won't, you know, have to think about whether you'd go home or your exams won't come on. What has changed? Yes, um, what you are saying is true mm. because in the, in the past, that was um, just last year, when CETA was on strike, CETA was on strike for quite some, some time, for about six weeks, mm. the Colleges of Education Teachers Association mm. were on strike. Mm. And then when they resumed from strike, what mm -hmm. happened in the colleges was the contact hours that were lost were recovered through the extension of the contact hours the teachers were now teaching in classes. So mm. if the teacher was teaching two hours, mm. the hours were ex extended to three hours. Mm. Just so you can, in the long run, you'll be able to recover all the lost contact hours that, that, that were lost. But quite unfortunate with, in the, with this one, it's quite different because that was then when the strike was called off. Mm. And now the strike is still not called off. The strike is still on. Mm. And then we are in the 45th day today. Mm. And then we are still The uh, College of Education Teachers Association are still striking. Mm. So as and when they call it off, then mm. we'll be able to calculate the number of contact hours that mm. have been lost. And then we'll okay. teach it. So it can happen that when they call off the strike, we cannot be able to use that extension of mm. hours to recover the contact hours lost. Because okay. in September 7th, the colleges will be going down. Okay. But if, from now to September 7th, it's just a short period. Mm. And then if you have two months being lost, you cannot use one month to recover two months of uh, contact hours. Okay. So, I mean, tomorrow we're ending July, and then August will come, and you're saying that 7th July. Uh, September. 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 Yeah, September. You have to go down. Um, which means that if they don't call it, what, when should be the last day that if the strike is not called off, it will be impossible for you to write the exam? Well, currently, as it's happening now, I would say we are even into that period already mm. that if the strike is not called off, because quite a number of times we have been engaging with the Minister of Education. We were there when he gave us the assurances, and then it extended into the 45th day, making it two months, almost mm. two months, mm. the Colleges of Education Teachers Association has been striking. And then even last, just, just um, last week, on 24th, we equally had another audience with the minister where we told him that will not be possible. But it was a conversation he asked um, the principals, that is the Conference of Principals of mm. Colleges of Education, to work with the affiliates to see how they can be able to recover those contact hours. Because if 7 September we are asking for an extension, or last, uh, next year we come to continue it, the, f the issue of feeding will, will be of great concern because mm. the feeding is being paid from the allowance that is being paid to the student. Oh, okay. Or, uh, so the colleges of uh, the principals pick a component from these allowances, allowances mm. and use for feeding. And that allowances are budgeted for a particular period. Mm. That's for the period the students stay in school. Mm -hmm. So what happens if the date has been altered. So we will have an issue of feeding to battle with, which we don't want to even go to that okay. um, line. Because mm. if you come back to the student again, because it's not fault of the student, the teachers are on strike. We have, are ready for teaching and learning. Mm. It's rather some issues that CTAG is having with government mm. or the employer. That is why we are in this. Okay. Week. But you are still being fed now, now that the strike is, is yes, ongoing. Yes, currently as the strike is ongoing, the colleges are being fed. Okay. Yes. And, but if you are being fed today, and if it's not by your doing, the strike is happening and it's called off, do you think that the, the principals would say, well, we're going to stop feeding you? Because your allowances will keep coming. Because will government stop it if, if this is prolonged? Yes, that's the point I made there. Mm. What, what happens is that mm -hmm. the allowances that are being paid are paid for the calculated period you are staying mm -hmm. in campus. Yes. So let's assume you are staying for two weeks or you are staying for a period of three months. Let's use September. We know that you have to go down let's September 7th. Okay. You go down September 7th. September 7th. Yes. That means the allowance has been calculated to September 7th that you'll be paid. Okay. So you'll be paid based on the month, the number of days you are spent in the school, mm. not the number of days you are spending outside the school. Okay. So if 7 September reaches and then the colleges are going for an extension, the amount that has been budgeted for the payment of allowance ends on September 7th. Mm. That means feeding will become an issue because mm. we will now pay for the feeding after 7 September. Mm. Is it the student, which uh, I don't think, because it's not the student's fault that this strike is happening. Mm. 
Mm. All right, Let, let's see how that, that uh, uh, goes, but it's quite interesting. If you speak to the, you say you met with a minister, what did he tell you in terms of settling these disputes with the teachers? Yes, uh, quite a number of times we've been with the minister. Mm. Assurances were given. Um, re quite recent, recent one that uh, we had an audience with him, we equally told him about these challenges that mm. are, that are coming, coming forth, and then he appreciated them and then um, assured us that he was going to meet with Sita, which Sita was at ministries mm. in the conference room. So he went down there. He gave us all the assurances, all the, um, the play out, how he was going to resolve the issues with Sita, and we should be very hopeful that Sita will be calling off the strike very soon. So after, then after meeting us, he, he met with Sita, and then afterwards we engaged with some reps from Sita, even the leadership I called um, the president for Sita, Mr. Mm. Prince of Binhema, and then we equally communicated with um, Prinkoff and mm. some agencies of government. They all attest to the fact that the meeting has been fruitful. Okay. Uh, the discussions, they made some progress, and mm. we should be hopeful that the strike will be called off soon. Mm. And then we were even hoping to hear some good news before the weekend. Yeah. And then Monday, which is, we are still here, and today is Tuesday, and then the strike is still ongoing. Mm. What the information we are picking is that CTAG is here to meet with its council and then decide. But what we still believe is that CTAG themselves made us aware that the discussions were fruitful mm -hmm. and then that, that gave us some hope. But, 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 but once the calling off didn't happen over the weekend and yesterday and today, what have you as leaders done to inquire why the strike is still in session? You've told me about the, the, the meeting with the council, but what is the, uh, uh, the teachers, what is the association doing to ensure that the, the pain that is brought on you, the student, is alleviated? Because now you say the negotiations were fruitful. Yes, that, that, was, that was according to yes. CTAC. Now, mm -hmm. um, what, what really happened is that over the weekend, mm -hmm. we've been following the events keenly, and then we were made to believe that there were some understandings or some memorandum of understanding mm. that was signed by both government and then CTAC. Mm. And then with these agreements that were signed, we were made to believe that the government was unwilling to sign, for which we now had the information that government has uh, played this part by signing to the agreement. CTAC has equally signed with the agreement. It's now left for CTAC to discuss it as a council and then give us a, uh, a feedback as to whether they are still holding on to the strike or they will be calling off the strike. Mm. So the agreement has been reached, but we are still not able to determine because CTAC says, unless it misses rank and file, mm. it misses uh, council, mm. and then they will decide. So because the, we received information that um, the government, government was unwilling mm. to commit itself in writing so that they will address the concerns raised by our teachers. Mm. We had to hold a press conference on Monday to appeal to the government and also let the government know the, the detrimental effects the strike is having on us. Mm. And then hopefully today we have received information that all the signings have been done, all the, everything has been put on paper. Okay. But, uh, like I said, mm. it's now left with um, CETA to meet with the its council, council mm. and then feed us with whatever. But the MOU, you can confirm, has been signed yes. between government and, and CETA. CETA. Yes. Okay. And that is what the CETA was waiting for. Exactly. For them to then call off the strike. Exactly. Okay. That, then it means that all is left or we expect that this strike can be called off at any point in time. Yes. That is a question left onto only CETA, CETA. to answer because... Mm they might either consider the MOU as a document they can work with and call off the strike, mm. or a document they feel is irrelevant mm. and also... So it's entirely a, a, a discussion or a decision that CTAC um, has the ultimate right to do. Mm. So, um, what are they, so we are only hopeful that okay. they might consider the document worthy mm. and call off the strike. How are you holding up on the various campuses, the students? Well, it hasn't been easy um, in all the 46 public colleges of education, students are really suffering, including myself. You, you imagine level 400 students who, are already, who have already committed themselves into rental agreements with their landlords and landladies with a set date, and then uh, we have this 
series of events turning out even level 100 to level 300 are just in the colleges. Some have even deserted home to their various homes. And then we don't even have reading materials. We don't have course out outlines. You are even reading. The advice we keep giving each other is take your study serious, read something. But you are even reading your books. You are, you are unsure whether you are within the catchment area for assessment or not because you are not, being give, you are not giving the course, out, the course manual and mm. the outline and even reading materials to guide your reading just as uh, we always have it in all the previous semesters. So it's really a challenge. If you even look at it from the full view, the challenge doesn't only come on the students. Even mm. the parents are equally suffering because parents are channeling all resources to their wards in these colleges. Okay. And then they are quite aware that by September 7th, my ward will be completing or would have been going down for the semester, mm. and then I'll be relieved. Then, then these parents are still committing resources into with no clear way because academic activities has come to a standstill. Mm -hmm. One concerned parent even um, placed a call to me some time ago and then she was lamenting. And the situation is not different because my parents themselves are equally complaining. Okay. So okay. They're the spending pressure, too much on you yes, and the they pressure, don't know when this is ending. Exactly. Mm. The pressure is, is, is just everywhere. Okay. In all the colleges, even guardians and parents are not mm. um, happy about the situation. So, so amongst the four years, uh, which groups are outside? You mentioned final years. Is it only the final year who have to rent or the other years that, that rent as well? Yes, it's only the final years that are outside. That okay. is because of the new policy okay. direction. So from level yeah. 100 to 300, you're all in the halls? You are all in the campuses, in okay. the colleges. Okay. So we have level 400 students who are renting outside the colleges. Mm. So, and all their expenses is done by themselves. Okay. And uh, unlike uh, the previous how we used to, we used to have it. Mm. Mm. So all these expenses are born out of the allowances. And your allowances, do they come? Well, allowances, uh, government has, 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 been, has been able to fulfill some months, mm. but though we always still have some in arrears. Currently, mm. as we talk now, we have like two months that is in arrears. And then this semester that, even though the strike has come to hit hard, but the students are still in the various campuses. So we have another one month that has not been paid. But the two months that I talked to you about was for the previous semester, for the first mm. semester. Mm. The government was expected to pay four months of arrears for uh, that one. Government only was able to pay two months out of the four, mm. leaving the, the two months still um, withholding. The last time we were having uh, an engagement with the Honorable Minister, he acknowledged that some funds have been is it, uh, in a pipeline and then mm. we should expect payment. But until it is done, we really can because no t timeline has been given okay. for the payment of these allowances. Mm. Uh, so mm. for now, as we talk now, mm. government still owes the teacher trainees two okay. months and more. Two months okay. and more. Plus one month of this semester. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. Um, Swale, all the best to you. We will keep an eye and, and watch when your teachers will call off your strike. Thank you. But in this period, we're all with you. Yeah. Thank you. So that uh, he is the president for the Teacher Trainees Association of Ghana. Now, if you use the Accra Tamamoto way often, I'm sorry, uh, your respite after the ga gaping portals uh, patches are over. Uh, the portals are back larger and unsafe than even before. My colleague Michael Papani Ashley and the team counted over 100 portals on the express highway. Drivers are growing increasingly anxious and are urgently appealing to the government to address the worsening condition of that road. In patchwork, plain and simple, we counted at least 100 portals on the Accra Tema stretch of the motorway. Iron rods in the concrete slabs are now visible, barely six months after the motorway benefited from the $150 million released for patching portals across the country. The rains came and simply washed away the bitumen and the portals have returned now larger and more treacherous than before. We have traveled less than half of the Tamabound section of the Accra Tema motorway. Already we have counted more than 22 potholes, one of which just behind me, staring us in the face. I can imagine a driver telling himself, Eric, 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 slow down, your tie's old, as he approaches this dangerous spot. 
Drivers have no option but to slump into the iron rods ridden potholes, ready to puncture the tires of unsuspecting motorists. Eric Opon is a victim. Um, last week, a blast for the I was I was um speeding light one, so I didn't see early. So I passed up where um the iron rods to the tire. I had the back tire, so um they blast the tire, so I come out the passengers. When it is morning and the evening, we have, we find it difficult for the motor to stop. Actually, can go if you go early, slowly, especially about a bridge. Okay, yeah. Yeah. There's, um, they can't do them recently, but I still know there's a heavy, heavy portals over there. Drivers are permitted a speed limit of 80 kilometers per hour. But to safely navigate the portals, drivers are forced to slow down, causing traffic congestion on the express highway. This year, the motor in about four. It's a difficult situation even for state institutions like the police service that has to respond to emergencies. They have to deal with this situation and drive as slowly as they can. To make matters worse, all the street lights that used to line up the entire stretch of the Tema motorway have all been removed. The exact reason we don't know. That means drivers will now have to drive in pitch darkness every night, aggravating and raising the level of danger on the Accra Tema motorway. <laughs> Rad hailing and taxi drivers like Steven Ayano now avoid working at night because of the poor condition of the motorway. It's no easy. There was a time I saw a portal around and I was like, ah, what is this? <laughs> on the motorway, driving on the motorway and seeing this portal, nah, it's not good. He tells me he nearly lost his life on the motorway. There was a pickup driving by. I think the driver was sleeping also. He saw a uh, port two on the road and we try to do it. Luckily, only God. If, if God did not come inside, like that time I could have lost my life that time. Sometimes someone stops me, me crash on my motorway. And I was saying, nah, because the way right now the road is, I won't go. Drivers, passengers and pedestrians are urging government to repair the deplorable road. So we are begging government to come throughout. Always government they pass through, but I don't know if they, maybe they see it or not. So we are begging them to come and see. We have to go on the contractors because the way maybe they come on the road and they do the road, they just do like part-time thing. They don't do it to last. It's just the part-time thing. When it rains, nah, that's it. After traveling the entire stretch of the motorway from Accra to Tema and back, we counted a staggering 112 potholes. A disaster waiting to happen. Drivers hope the government will fix it before it gets worse. For Joy News, Michael Ashali. Well, let's do more on this uh, by taking you live to the, to, to the Tema Motorway now to uh, check out what's really happening after we started telling this story. Papani Ashley, who produced that particular report you saw there, is coming to us live from the motorway. Uh, Papani, what can you report for, for us now? So, Brace, thankfully, the ministry has heard our plea and the story that we did just days ago. We were here last week and potholes like these were scattered all along this small stretch of road. We counted at least 15 of them at the time that we came here. So the yellow vehicle you see somewhere far back there is the vehicle I'm told is helping them to patch these potholes. So on that side of the road is fresh bitumen that has now been laid on the motorway. 
for drivers, some respite at least for now. Uh, it would have been difficult to use this small stretch of the way. Right from the Tama side of the road going towards Accra, you'd realize that you see patches of this. If you get to the Azul Way Bridge here, you know if you are heading from Tama to Accra, you are mandated if you have some certain load to pass there. That small stretch of road that leads to the Azul Way Bridge was very terrible, but that has also received some fresh coat of asphalt. But Brace, to tell you the extent of damage that we are dealing with and the impact of drivers here, I'll be talking to a driver shortly who lost his star just two minutes ago. This portal here is the cause of that. Some of these portals have iron rods sticking out of them. And I'll try to reach the driver uh, pretty shortly if you give us a few words. This driver just moments ago lost his star and it must be a very difficult situation for him. If, if not for he being careful where he was driving lower than the expected speed limit, he would have been able to uh, possibly get an accident with that. But by God's grace, he's fine. He's gotten the best out of the situation. Uh, that red car there. So they have gotten some help. They are trying to fix the tar and replace uh, the tar. For them, they'll be grateful that they weren't over speeding. Uh, so therefore, they were able to bring the vehicle to a halt uh, in the nick of time so that nothing bad uh, happens. Gentlemen, good evening. I trust you are doing well. Uh, <laughs> you are fine. I'm surprised you say you are fine. <laughs> Personally, we are fine, but the car is not fine. Interesting. I mean, tell me about your situation. And this just happened around where you have the, lots of portals exactly, there. Exactly. Uh, how did all this happen? When we were coming, we just surprised. We, 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 we ran to a portal, a very big one, and then we bust our tire. Wow. And just to give some context, this is the exact spot where some maintenance works is being done. So just half of that stretch of road had been fixed. And now they are racing against time to try and get to wherever they were going. But so. Tell me, you were surprised by, by that particular no, portal? Very surprised. You never used the, the motorway? No, 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 no. No, I, I've been using the motorway, but this one, it was a surprise. I didn't know what happened because it's too big. You see, the motorway is a, it's a way that everybody is passing through. So we have to make sure that all these portals are being filled. Because look at this. The tie, we, can't, we, can't, we have to replace it before we can go wherever we are going. Because of this portal. It's, understand? Hey, so... I think it is very bad. I'm very, very surprised. Very, very surprised that I was able to. Run. For, for many situations, uh, it doesn't end as well as yours did. As yeah. bad as it is right now, I can tell you on record that it's, it's better. For many people, when they miss it, they end up in the bushes or just an accident. Of yeah. course, it's a little better, but it's not all that good. Because suppose, look at this. We are were, we were running from that place to this place. Suppose, have you seen the, the gutter? You should have even gone to that, that, that gutter simply. You're a good driver. Thank you. Now, I mean, we've, we've been highlighting the dangers on the portal for so long. It appears that not so much attention has been brought to it. I mean, as a driver that frequently uses the motorway, how, how much of a concern are you? And this, the motorway's deplorable stage is not the only problem. All the street lights, if it was in the evening, I don't think that you would have survived this. It's true, it's true. Look at the number of cars that passes through the motorway. A lot of cars are passing here, understand? So I, I'm very much concerned. I, they should try as much as possible to fix all these uh, potholes because it's very dangerous. Suppose it, 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 it should be in the night. It is very dangerous. So they should try as much as possible to make sure that all these potholes are being filled. If they are not doing the, the, the road completely, like this, the potholes, the potholes should, be, should be filled. Understand? So that everybody will, will, will be okay because it's very, very dangerous, my friend. Very dangerous. So what, what are you going to do now? Uh, we have but, but do you know the situation with the tire? Is it that is, it's completely destroyed? Yes, it's completely destroyed. We have to change it. But we have a, the, the spare tire here, here, so we are going to fix it and make sure that we, we can carry on wherever we are going. Interesting. I'm grateful. Thank you for your time. What was your name? My name is Reverend Addison. Reverend, uh, Reverend Addison. At uh, Afrifa. You very lucky gentleman. Thank you very much for talking to us. So, um, if you ever had a doubt as to the dangers uh, that motorists put themselves through every day whilst they commute on the Accra Tema motorway. Reverend Addison just gave us a very good picture. He lost his vehicle, uh, his star, just moments ago whilst uh, trying to maneuver around a pothole that surprised him. Well, we understand that they are um, efforts to try and rehabilitate it or to maintain it whilst government uh, tries to find 
the money and the time and the space to reconstruct the entire Accra Tema motorway. But in interim, drivers will have to bear with the deplorable nature of the Rosso Brace. This is exactly what we have here. Uh, let's try and get close to where some of the works have been. Then we can check whether or not uh, to see exactly what is happening. So uh, Papani will still try and get to some where some of the uh, repair works have been done so that we can, we can see the sort of work uh, be, being done there. But, okay, I'm being told that what we are looking at now is uh, part of the works that have been done. You can see the, the, uh, the cars bumping into them, but Papani will still get quite close so you can see actually uh, some of the repair works that have been done. But what you see there now, I'm told, uh, part of the, uh, you know, the works that have currently been done. And you can see the, uh, you know, the equipment that is, that is being used. They call it the asphalt plant. So they've mounted one asphalt plant there that is being used. Okay, good. So you can clearly see the remedial works that have been done now. And this is, this is what the highways is doing to fix, uh, fix some of the patches on the motorway. But the, uh, uh, the thought that everybody expresses is that when is the real uh, reconstruction work going to begin on the motorway? But my colleague, Papani, the, uh, kudos for that work. He's still on the motorway, gauging the mood of drivers and, and, and to also um, see what is being done. This is still the, uh, joint, the, the pause here on the Johnny's channel, but the Johnny's Impact Maker Awardee in Rural Livelihood Empowerment Dr. Kwame Sakwa Aidu has ferried approximately 3.6 kilo, uh, kilograms of honey from Donko Chrome in the eastern region to cities including Accra, Cape Coast, Kumasi, and Takrade. Uh, this initiative marks a significant shift from the community's traditional trade of timber and charcoal. For many residents, this change not only offers environmental relief in the face of climate change, but also brings substantial economic benefits. There's more in his report. Honey from Donkokrum to Accra, Cape Coast, Kumasi, and Takradi marks a significant shift from the community's traditional trade of timber and charcoal, bringing both environmental and economic benefits. Residents say they are hopeful that the new venture would encourage more young people to take up beekeeping reducing the community's reliance on charcoal production and its associated pollution. The truck driver who transported the first batch of honey expressed his excitement about the new development. He shared his relief that the job of loading charcoal onto trucks has been replaced with a more rewarding and environmental friendly tax of producing honey from trees. This initiative not only aims to conserve the environment, but also provide a sustainable source of income for the community. Dr. Edu and B for Development Ghana are leading the way in making a positive impact on both the environment and the livelihood of people in Donkokrum. What uh, an impactful journey being done there by Dr. Edu and his team. Well, the Nido Obatampamo promo has rewarded three winners and uh, their families with an all-expense-paid weekend trip to Safari Valley Resort. Additionally, fridges, kente cloth, and cash prizes have been given to 15 people as a way to say thank you for their loyal, uh, to their loyal customers. The Nido Obatampamo promo which began in May this year, has culminated in rewarding three winners and their families with an all-expense paid trip to Safari Villa Resort, including a stipend of 5,000 cedars. Additionally, five people received refrigerators, five were awarded kinte cloth, and five others received a cash prize of 5,000 cedars each. In an interview with category manager for dairy products at Nestle Ghana, Gilbert Koja stated this promo was the first of its kind associated with the Nido brand and it was done to appreciate their loyal customers. So for brand Nido, uh, mothers and mother figures are really important to us. We appreciate the great job that they do in nurturing their children. So we decided to take the opportunity to reward mothers and mother figures uh, for being great parents to, to their children and that is why we came up with this Nido Obatampamo promotion. 
He added that he received 89,485 entries for the promo and explains how they settled on the winners. This is the, the first time that a brand has really done a code in pack kind of promo. <laughs> so the, the code to participate in the promo was inside the sachet, <laughs> which meant you had to consume the product before you participate. And uh, we had, we were overwhelmed, over 89,000 entries across uh, the country. And then we partnered, of course, with NLA on their Caritas Lottery platform. Uh, we used technology to randomly, uh, through free and fair means, to select the winners that today we have rewarded here. This market day, a recipient of an all-expense paid trip to Safari Villa Resort, expressed gratitude to Nido and Nestle Ghana. I was excited. First beginning, I was thinking it's one of the uh, firsts by the call. The course was keeping coming, so the more they call me, I give them the instruction when they need it. So I was happy. I want to tell them a very big thank you for Nurses Ghana Nido, because it's not easy. Well, Deputy Chief of Staff in charge of operations at Jubilee House, Emmanuel Ni Adumwa Bosman, says he will alert President Ekofuado to ensure the directive on the release of some military land in Labadi to the people of La is fulfilled. He announced this when the coalition of La youth embarked on a demonstration and petitioned the presidency over the sale of some land in La. There's more in this report. The Coalition of Law Associations and the Gadangbe Coalition Against Land Injustice announced a few days ago they were embarked on a series of demonstrations in demand for immediate reversal of government and other private ownership of their lands. The two groups are raising concerns about how lands on their soil are being sold out to politically affiliated persons. The group embarked on their first demonstration today and presented a petition to the Deputy Chief of Staff. Jeffrey Tete, a spokesperson for the Coalition of La Association. This petition is addressed to the President, His Excellency Nana Dudanko Akufuado. Petition by the people of La on the immoral looting of lands by some state officials, some political figures. We say enough is enough. Your Excellency, this petition has become extremely necessary to bring to your attention, attention of your good office, once again, the continuous and unprecedented wanton dissipation of lands in the greater Accra region of Ghana, more especially within the La traditional area by government and some state officials. The rapid manner in which these lands are being sold out to politicians and cronies as well as private developers is not only a disturbing but also a subject of public concern. This phenomenon snacks of, snacks of the highest level of disregard from the government for the traditional authorities under whose jurisdiction these lands are located, more especially the chiefs of law. Your Excellency, one of these lands which is dear to our hearts and that of the chiefs and people of law is the Plato land. We wish to express our profound gratitude to you for keeping to your promise by ensuring the release of 114.26 acres of land in controversy with the Ghana Armed Forces. In response, Deputy Chief of Staff Emmanuel Ni Eduma Bosman will receive the petition on behalf of President Akufuadu as assured that he would alert the president to release the land to the people. Yeah. Yo, anyway. um, thank you very much. Um, my brethren from La. Okay, work there. Um, I listened very um, attentively to what was read. Um, it is instructive to note that you are actually addressing this petition to the Commander in Chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. Um, you have mentioned issues that concern the Minister for Defense. Um, the Honorable Dominic Ditiwo and the Chief of Defense Staff is not a Brigadier General, he's a Lieutenant General Thank you, sir. upon paper. I would relay these messages to the President. If the President has given a directive or an order, it is to be implemented as he has directed. So I'll draw his attention. 
I cannot stand here and purport to say I know the details of it, but the president has just re returned from Gumwa. He's in there. I'll take this straight to him. And what needs to be done, I am sure, will be addressed. The group says they will continue to embark on a series of demonstrations if nothing is done about their petition. Rejoice Semifa pursues reports read to All right, so let's do more on this. And we're being joined in studio by Jeffrey Tete, who's spokesperson for the Coalition of La, um, you know, Associations. I'm grateful to you, Jeffrey, for coming. So my understanding is that this 114.26 acres um, of land has been given to you, but you don't have access? Yes, exactly. Okay. And uh, we seem not to understand why this is happening, because it's been two years now since uh, the president authorized for documentations to be given to us, and this was worked out by the Honorable Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, the Honorable Samuel Abujinapo. Mm. And so the traditional authorities, the two has possession of the documents. Unfortunately, we do not have access to the land itself mm. because the Chief of Defense Staff, under the instruction of the Minister, uh, Dominic Nitewo, have always instructed their men, heavily armed, to accost us whenever we try to go onto the land and start some work. Mm. Now, so you have the document that these, these lands are for you, yes. but you don't have access. Is there anything happening on, the, on, on those lands? Okay, so interestingly enough, mm. the land in total measures way over 500 uh, acres. Okay. Um, when we started under the previous lands minister, Honorable Asuma Chemi, the people of La were supposed to get about 250 acres of the land. Eventually, when Honorable Samuel Abu Jinapo took office, he decided that there has to be a renegotiation. So the chiefs, the Ghana Armed Forces, the Defense Ministry, Lands Commission, Lands Ministry, all went into a committee. They were invited into a committee. They worked for about two years and came up with an arrangement that instead of the 250, the La people should be given uh, that is uh, 114.26. And then the remainder given to the Ghana Armed Forces. But the ones that were given to the Armed Forces, they were to take steps to acquire them. Okay. That's government. Which okay. means that it wasn't for them. So they were to, government was to take steps to acquire those lands for them. None of that has from, been done. From you, the, yes, the from chiefs. Us. Okay. Exactly. None of that, that has been done. It, it was so because they pleaded that they needed some of the land for development. None of that has been done. Mm. And then the one that we have been given rightfully, they are also preventing us from having access to those lands. Mm. Mm. So, so, I mean, the 114.26, nothing is happening on them. They okay. are bare lands. Okay, so we have noticed that some of those lands, the military on several occasions has tried to get onto the portion that belongs to us mm. and they are trying to do some developments. For instance, when you go deep into the army, I think it's around the garrison area that's behind their mess, that is where you have the, where the land that belongs to La, I mean, our boundary starts, we share. The one that was boundary. given to you. Yes, and when you go there right mm. now, because we know we, together with the Ghana Armed Forces, and the Lands Commission and all the stakeholders involved, we went onto the land and we agreed on where the demarcations should be done. So they are fully aware. And we can even tell you the people from the Ghana Armed Forces who represented them on the committee. They were there when the pillars were mounted. Now they have gone onto the portion that belongs to us. Okay. And surprisingly, there is a portion around the Major Mahama area, which at the time that was given to us, the Ghana Armed Forces said, they had earmarked for an international um, hospital okay. today. A search on that land will indicate that about two acres of that land, which they said was going to be used for a hospital, for which the people of La were being given uh, a stake in, a portion of that land has been sold out to some business uh, entities in this country, surprisingly. Mm. So even what they said they were going to use the land for, uh, they have done something which is contrary to that. And so they have deceived... You have uh, such evidence of that search? We that have it. I don't have it here, but we can mm. send it to you as evidence so you see what I is mean, happening. so you have it? Yes. That says that two acres of that particular has land... Has been given to somebody, private mm. entity. For what purpose? Because they said they were going to build a hospital. Yes. What if that 
supposed that entity is supposed to put up that the hospital the hospital is supposed to cover a certain acreage of land mm. which has been agreed upon and a portion of that acreage has been carved out and sold to somebody mm. a private entity so obviously it is not the hospital mm. that the person is going to build on that uh, okay. portion is that part of your 140 no, unfortunately, uh, fortunately for us, that is not part of our 114. Mm. But I'm highlighting this mm. to tell you that uh, the military used certain tactics to deceive the, uh, the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. Mm. So, so that, so, so, so that one is on land that are supposed to be for the military, right? Not it's not on the, the one there. Because we also have a stake in what is going to happen. Happen there. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. So it's a shared uh, okay. interest. Mm. But... When you look but, at but, I, but I mean, I was asking that on the 114, which is supposed to be for you, yes. are there any development on it? Yes, they've and, started and said, some development. That's what I spoke mm, to you about. That yeah. They have crossed into our boundary and they've started some construction. Work. What is being done there? We, we actually can't tell what they are putting about. There is some construction going on. And unfortunately, it is the only access you can have is through Bema Camp. So when you try to go in there, then they try to prevent you from going. But... Mm. Uh, we have found some ways of getting to those portions mm. and we have seen what is actually going on there. Okay. And we have confirmed that they have crossed into uh, our boundary. Mm. They've done some foundations on their own. Yes, not just foundation. They've started building. You can see um, uh, some blocks already springing up. For the military or for individuals? That we cannot tell. Okay. Mm. Because you also mentioned here the prison service lands can torment trade fair development energy city project that's the airport city phase two uh, are they all on this 114 no these are other land issues mm. we are talking about cantonments laboni if you know um sales bridge the entire estates around sales bridge have been mm. sold out and okay. that was supposed to be for government services to house government officials when you mm. go between laboni secondary school mm. and coffee shop okay. the estate in between which is supposed to house government officials mm. the entire estate has been sold out okay. and interestingly enough there are some properties there that belongs to people who are serving in government currently okay so mm. that is where we, we we are raising eyebrows because you see for the people of la our expectation is that we give out land for national development and we expect that it will get to a time when some of these lands will be returned to our people mm. for our own development. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, if we sit down and allow the uh, unwarranted dissipation of these lands, which is immoral, mm. okay, mm. it will get to a time our people, the generations behind us, wouldn't get a place to lay their heads. Okay. And that right. is why we are crying today. And mm. our cry mm. also goes to other traditional areas that if you don't come to support the people of La today in this cry, okay. when our lands are dissipated, it will get to your turn and they will move to your end. But if we come together and we halt this process, then we can be assured that it wouldn't okay. split a lot right. and yours also. Okay. Jeffrey, well, we, we are with you. We will see what government will do. And government says it has received your petition and they are going to work on it. So let's see how it goes. Thank you. All right. So that uh, uh, Jeffrey Tete, he, he speaks for the Coalition of La Associations. There's still the uh, uh, policy on the joining channel. We'll take a very quick break. We'll be back, please. Do stay. Welcome back. And uh, that's all we have for you in today's edition of The Post. But there's more news on myjoyonline.com. And it says uh, the ambulance uh, case, Court of Appeal, um, uh, you know, acquits and discharges are to force in and Jaffa updated. That is what is there. Also, Godfrey Dummy as AG means innocent people will go to jail that is what jack is saying it's on majorline.com when you go there now you can read that for yourself and, and plus other stories all right thank you so much for being a part of us today on the pulse um but there is more for us to share with you tomorrow when we meet uh, but there's more coming up here on this channel especially lts which is which comes right after this show. Grateful. My name is Samuel Kojo Brace. On behalf of the team, please, thanks for being a part of us.